I thought Terry was going to be here. It's a lot changing. Apparently it is. That's what the Buddha said. <laughs> mm. So it's been an interesting week. Um, how's everybody doing? <laughs> I've had a lot in my head this week. Yes? Yes, it's good. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, when, you, when you're just doing it by yourself, it's just easy to not do it or, you know, skip it out. <laughs> mm hmm. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. And so, Mm-hmm. Yes. Community is a big part of it. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's um, attached to more community members. Mm -hmm. The Buddha said it's the the whole of the spiritual life. It's good company. It could be a big deal. I hope it's already affecting my head. I mean, just the. Well, I was thinking of uh, exploring a discourse that speak a little bit on that, actually. Um, how the um, steadiness in the practice or kind of uh, having um, some time dedicated for the practice uh, not only every week every day is good but <laughs> um, every every week there is something that in in Buddhism that we call uposatha and uh, this is a bit like what sabbat would be uh, but it's not we don't call it that obviously that's it's not the right term because it's not exactly what that means for us um, basically uposatha was uh, pre-buddhist it was already uh, an observance day that some a lot of spiritual traditions would hold and uh, of course some 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 would fast some would do all kinds of things uh, but then uh, the origin is traced in the Vinaya when we read the Vinaya which not a lot of people do uh, we can we can know that uh, at some point the, the Buddha felt like it was needed to take on kind of thing because peop there was a demand for it like why aren't, aren't we following like having a, a day of observance or something like that and this a bit when the patimoka started to happen also at the beginning um, there wasn't any rules <laughs> in the monastic uh, life now there's 227 that we called the patimoka 
and uh, <laughs> um, that's just the ones that are like official there's thousands <laughs> of others that are in the book is just basically just a way of living you know just a guideline basically guidelines and um, the Uposata was basically a day where well it is uh, the day on the full moon and the new moon where people would gather together the monks especially would recite the Patimokkha all of the rules the monastic rules um, to uh, to a skilled reciter we call them reciters uh, of the Patimokkha people that commit those to memory technically we're all kind of supposed to do that because we're supposed to follow these rules so if we don't know them we're a bad start <laughs> so uh, but to a skilled reciter um, it takes 45 minutes at a good speed so <laughs> it's uh, and just uh, they would be standing in the middle and the monks would go around him or her if it's a nun and uh, he would just recite the Patimokkha like off the top of his head uh, out of memory and uh, we all listen and we all kind of if there's like a mistake or something we'll just like uh, somebody would follow with them and so uh, this is a bit of an introduction to say what the monastics do but really there, there's more than this there's um, uh, it's be become every quarter moon basically uh, because at that time it was the the moon calendar it's the lunar calendar the monks the monastic life gravitates around the lunar calendar because at that time there was no clock there was no <laughs> there's no watch there's no iPhone <laughs> so the moon was the time basically so and every quarter moon is basically once a week if we kind of boil it down to what really what that means because there's no esoteric reason why it's every quarter moon <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's like oh yeah it's really because of you know like <laughs> the planets and nah. it's just because you can tell it's like it's been seven days or something <laughs> so um, and there's this really uh, this uh, discourse that um, the, the Buddha gives and uh, I, I gave a talk on, on this discourse particularly like a year and a half ago we just had the Kuti it was one of the first ones it was a fearless and uplifted and it was uh, the recollections of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and how it brings joy actually how it brings up it uplifts the mind and recollecting the virtue and recollecting in this one there's the devas but also there is uh, generosity uh, also as a uplifting recollection um, in other discourses that the Buddha teaches and I thought I would um, we could maybe speak a little bit more about that today because um, it's pretty ne it's pretty neat to kind of import that idea of um, having a whole day basically every week or every couple of weeks or every month whatever you want to do but <laughs> it's really all up to you really but I think it's really nice to um, to kind of bring that in to uh, our lives and to dedicate one day you know of usually uh, so basically the practice now is usually every quarter moon people would gather uh, either in their monasteries or uh, local monastery or hermitage either listen to the Dhamma then practice like uh, giving or like doing any chores that need to be done or try to help you know the like when you go at Vipassana <laughs> for example you sometimes you go and serve well that's kind of the same thing it's practicing generosity and actually it's really helpful um, 
and taking on the virtues, either the five or the eight, and kind of making a the the people that follow the five virtues. It's nice to take the eight for that for that day, and people that don't follow any of the virtues, it's nice to take the five. <laughs> so or like just have a day or that you're like really committed to this, and so that um, and it's actually quite wonderful to. Um, it really does uplift the mind. It really gives. <laughs> yes, and obviously, um, meditation, having that d a day for meditation, mostly, really, because, I mean, that's the highest merits that we can do. But we can't always meditate, that's the thing. <laughs> so <laughs> there's other things that we can do to kind of get our minds to gravitate more and more towards uplifted states which is the Buddha's teaching on meditation that's what the Buddha taught like when you read meditation instructions from the Buddha especially to the, the laity and or people that are beginning in the practice uh, that's that's all he talks about is uplifting the mind gladdening the mind bringing the joy back and that sheds all defilements that helps the mind b gets collected and uh, but abandoning defilements and collectedness is, to, is the same thing it's, it's, it means the same thing it's when there's no more defilement what's left is is samadhi so that's really easy to understand and the sutta is particularly clear <laughs> <laughs> about it so that's a wonderful wonderful thing and that's all us we're all um, we choose to do that or or not but we have that because the Buddha taught also karma like this is everything that is happening is because there's a cause and a condition it arises because of a cause and when we know how the causes work, <laughs> we can play with them <laughs> and make it better <laughs> for us. Or um, um, that's what the Eightfold Path is. That's what, um, you know, otherwise, if we couldn't change, if there wasn't change possible, the Buddha says, you know, if, if, if there was no possibility to change, I wouldn't be teaching. <laughs> so... There is that option. Like we're not like there's n everything can change, and that's that's what the very nature of mental development, bhavana, is. Is that yes, things get better in when we take, when we understand dharma, when we practice that, and it might you know sometimes things might take a little bit of time in certain aspects of whatever of our lives or what, whatever it is might take a little bit of time but slowly as we place things in order it will start to kind of shape up so I tried to translate that that sutta uh, this week that was my project and uh, took me all week and it was a bit longer than I expected um, so um, Um, because it's um, when when mostly it's uh, poly concerned with uh, dharma uh, related uh, words and topics. This is quite easy, but uh, there's a lot of analogies, which is wonderful. Actually, it's one of the beauties of that sutta because it's easier to it's, it's nice to have these images. But it's a lot of uh, different terms, I guess, that I'm not <laughs> that used to. So that was a lot of a uh, lot of digging and trying to figure out because uh, they don't do things the way that we do either. So, <laughs> so 2,600 years ago, you know, the way you clean clothes is not what we do right now. <laughs> so, so just you know, there's <laughs> was a lot of time spent on, and there's a bit a big chunk of. Um, cosmology at the end so uh, I know some people might like that part but that, that's also another uh, less usual uh, um, 
uh, section of the sutta which and so this this lays down basically um, what the Buddha advised to the, and this is to Visaka Visaka was his uh, chief uh, supporter uh, uh, female supporter because there was Anata Pindika uh, f- as a male who offered Savati uh, uh, Jeta's Grove the monastery there and uh, Visaka was known as Migara's mother uh, and um, she offered another monastery as well in Savati and um, so she's a very uh, prominent uh, disciple of, of his and she's a very clever woman very very good woman and um, he gives her instructions on how one should spend their uposatha, their observance day, basically, as, as, as a practitioner of the path that the Buddha taught, the uposatha of the Aryas. Um, I was going to print it, but it's like 26 pages. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's better, probably better not to. Huh? Yeah, and it's going to change for a little bit. So. Mm-hmm. Are you warm enough? I am. Yeah. I think so, yes. Okay. Yes. I have some blankets here too. I just, uh, uh, maybe I put it too close. And so basically, I think uh, this this talk, uh, I think I uh, this talk should probably be uh, called the uh, "Don't Forget the Joy," <laughs> because <laughs> because I think that's really what's coming out of this this discourse is really "Don't Forget the Joy," and that's the uposatha of the Aryas. And so obviously, there's this cl- classic introduction of "Thus have I heard" and all this and. Um, Visaka arrives at uh, her hermitage. An interesting fact about hermitages or monasteries in, in Pali is called Arame, and Arame is a ple- it's it's a special name for uh, kind of a kind of a Buddhist monastery, but it means a delightful place. Actually, that's what it actually means. <laughs> so an Arame, Arame is where you go to delight. Or <laughs> so she arrives and pays respect to the Buddha obviously and uh, the Buddha asks uh, come now Visaka for what reason have you come here in the middle of the day because that was uh, usually people would go later in the evening for a talk or something Bhante today I am observing the Uposatha Visaka, there are three kinds of uposatha observance. What are they? There is the farmer's observance, there is the niganta's observance, and the arya's observance. Interestingly, the, the Buddha never called his teaching Buddhism, <laughs> Obvious, obviously, <laughs> right? <laughs> it makes sense. But what the closest thing that we could find to that at his in his time that he was using is Arya, the teaching of the Aryas. So really, this this teaching should m- probably more be called the teaching of the Aryas <laughs> rather than Buddhism or Aryaism. But it 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 has little bit of a dark spot on that name unfortunately which is so unfortunate because I mean the Buddha was quite a long time before that and his teaching is amazing but the world samsara is samsara (laughs) so it's like a Bihar now where is the, the, the state Uttar Pradesh and Bihar some of the poorest states in India now where the Buddha was, where the Buddha lived most of his time. And those, those are the poorest states in India now. So it's quite interesting to 
Think about that. So what is the farmer's observance? In the evening, a farmer gathers his cows back to the farm, thinking, Today the cows have walked in such and such a field. They drank in such and such a creek. Tomorrow I will, them, I will bring them in such and such a pasture, and they will drink from such and such a creek. Very pragmatic uh, <laughs> um, down-to-earth business. In the same way, he would observe the Uposata thinking, I am hungry. I should eat such and such food or prepare such and such a meal. Tomorrow I will eat such and such food or prepare such such a meal. As a result of this, he spends his entire day with a, with a mind sullen, pulled, and filled by desires. This is the Uposata observance of the farmer Visaka. Observed in such a way, the farmer's observance does not yield abundant fruits. It is not highly beneficial, and neither does it shine. It is neither vast nor pervasive. Um, I don't know where everybody is from here, but uh, I was uh, uh, born and raised in a family that didn't have a religious background I guess that's a good thing for a lot of reasons um, but that is one thing that for me later was felt was that uh, this kind of everything material uh, <laughs> was there was something missing for me anyways I couldn't relate to that and that's what this farmer's observance to me that's what the image comes to mind for me is this really, you know, this very pragmatic material outlook, perspective on life, on everything, and that there's no, you know, there's, you know, you don't go too far off from that, and you just like, but it's, um, I didn't know then, because <laughs> you don't know when you're, you're little, you don't know what other options you got <laughs> but uh, slowly and slowly it, it was felt more and more as a something was uh, lacking somehow like there's meaning that is missing because why <laughs> why why doing all of these things you know like there's so many other things that is like <laughs> Yeah, like I can gather my cows, sure, but like, <laughs> but, but what about the meaning of what I'm doing here? <laughs> like, what what are we all doing here? And um, I felt this was kind of uh, very oppressive in the mind for me. It was very heavy, and that's something that, anyways, I thought uh, maybe. Uh, Yeah, maybe it's just me. <laughs> what is the observance of the Nigantas? And the Nigantas are known as the Jains, supposedly. But here the practice that they describe is a bit different than what we know as the Jains. So I don't know if what happened in the middle. But uh, So that's why I just keep it as the Nigantas, not the Jains, because... The Jains are really known for their practice of non-violence, and they even put like face covers over there, <laughs> and they they sweep, they sweep, they don't broom, they sweep the little bugs that might be crawling on their path. So uh, different uh, different approaches to the observance here, but we're slowly kind of making our way to, to the Buddha's observance. There is a tradition of spiritual wanderers called the Nigantas. They instruct their followers saying, Come, my dear, 
let go of all weapons and violence towards all beings in the eastern direction farther than a hundred yojanas a yojana is like an ancient measure system it's like saying a league but it's 15 kilometers roughly seven miles let go of all weapons and violence towards all beings in the eastern in the western direction farther than 100 yojanas in the northern and the southern direction farther than 100 yojanas hence they instruct they instruct kindness and compassion for some beings but for others not while observing the oposata they instruct their their followers saying come my dear rid yourself of all your clothes and go about saying I am not anywhere belonging to anything nor is there anything belonging to me anywhere at all although their parents know very well this is our child and so do they know very well these are my parents although their husband or wife and children know very well this is the one who provides for us and sustains us and these know very well these are my wife husband and children although their servants maids helpers and workers know very well this is our lady or our master and they know very well these are our servants maids helpers and workers <laughs> are you following uh, up until this point it's it's a bit you know it's a bit on the we have to imagine a few things <laughs> right now but uh, slowly we'll uh, because of this at a time when they should be instructed on truth on truthfulness the oposata is supposed to be uh, you know they are instructed about pretending and falsehood I say that such speech is not speaking truthfully. And when the night draws to an end, they take back their possessions and clothes without anyone giving it back to them. I say that this is taking what is not theirs anymore. <laughs> so we're a bit playing on words here, but this is the Uposata observance of the Nigantas Visaka. Hence, the Niganta's observance does not yield tremendous fruits. It is not the most beneficial. It is not luminous, and it does not particular. It is not particularly vast nor pervasive. And what Visaka is the Uposata of the Aryas? I was actually hesitating to read this first section at first because it's a bit. <laughs> it's a bit bit of extra information but I think it's kind of might be interesting to put things in perspective that there's you know there these were practices at that time and there's a few instances in the discourses where the Buddha will actually say because there was so many kinds of different spiritual paths that um, the Buddha will kind of really explain his teaching and what what is different really how it moves away from certain practices and now we have this very uh, classic introduction of the Buddha where he's gonna start talking about mental development and so he says impurities in the mind are cleansed by diligent practice Visaka <laughs> So it's a very, uh, very unique approach here for that time, especially. How is it so? Here, one follows the path of the Aryas, repeatedly calls, one who follows the path of the Aryas, repeatedly calls to mind the Buddha in this way. The awakened one is a Narahant, a fully awakened Buddha. His knowledge and behavior are perfected. He is the exalted one, the one who has understood the world, the unequaled teacher of beings who seek to master themselves. 
the teacher of divine beings and humans. He is the Buddha, the auspicious one. When one repeatedly calls to mind the Buddha, the mind becomes clear and bright. Joy wells up from within. And the mind sheds its defilements. And this is, this is really a section, well, it, it comes back really often in, in this discourse in particular, but this is a very, very important feature of what the Buddha taught as, as the approach to meditation is really. And now he's talking about, you know, these really wholesome recollections that we can do. Um, in the first, the first bit, he's saying the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. The more we get to know the qualities of the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha, and not blindly, through our own practice and through reading and learning, it's actually really beautiful and uplifting. And so, at the beginning, it's kind of strange because it sounds like he's trying to <laughs> indoctrinate people kind of thing, right? <laughs> like it's, it's that classic, you know, oh yeah, you should just believe in me. <laughs> like, but it's not like that. It's not, it's different. It's really, <laughs> and that's why he says um, someone who follows that path already, you know, it's not something that you say just like that to people that are not following that path that are not you know that don't know anything about that path it's it's something that you tell people that already know about a few things and that they experience it within themselves and then then they can understand the buddha's not trying to indoctrinate you he's trying to <laughs> uplift you actually it's a beautiful recollection and so to understand these these qualities i don't know if i want to spend too much time on these qualities right now but this is what we uh, we start with every puja is that itipi so bhagava araham samma sambuddho vija charana sampanna sugato loka and the, these are all this is what i just read and so these are very uh, central to the teaching and when the buddha teaches that he teaches that these should be uplifting recollections that we use to imbue the mind with joy. And when there's joy in the mind, there's no defilements <laughs> because there cannot be. It's uplifted. It's happy. It's, that's, it's one or the other. And that's the beauty of the Buddha's teaching. But I will maybe speak a bit more when the recollection of the Dhamma comes about this. And keep in mind that this, these recollections, like practicing loving kindness, for example, is extremely close to this. I mean, it's just another way of saying like a recollection of loving kindness. It's not talked about it in here, but it's the same way that the practice works. It's uplifting the mind, it's compassion, boundless joy. It's all, it's all leading to the same place. He's not going to mention them, the Brahma Viharas in this particular one, but this is all the same. Um, there, there are suttas where he says, uh, he talks a bit more, a little bit like this, but about the Brahma Viharas, how one should develop them, and which uplifts the mind, and the um, limited karma, Limited karma is abandoned. I don't know if you read the sutta I gave you. <laughs> that's one of the most beautiful things about that sutta. Uh, that's why I translated it as the, um, the Brahma Viharas, the way that they're described. He really, it's a unique, um, I think there might be one other mention like that in the whole canon. But he says when the I mean, boundless love is practice like that really boundlessly then there's no limited karma in the mind there's no greed there's no hate there's no delusion there's just that boundless wholesomeness either one of the brahma viharas and so that limited karma is is it cannot be so that's um, and that's how you overcome you know any existing karma you override you change 
and that that's another unique feature of the Buddha's teaching where there were some teacher at his time that would say like anything you do like uh, if you've done something that that's it like that you've done that you can't change that like it's or some people were completely nihilistic like they said or there's there's no virtue at all there's no there's no sense of there's nothing given like that, that doesn't mean anything you know there's nothing that you could do to help someone or you know if you kill someone it doesn't change anything it doesn't have any impact uh, but the Buddha was always very uh, clear that's the, the beauty of his teaching is that uh, he draws the line between these things and says no there is karma there is action there is fruit of action kama vipaka uh, cause and effect basically that's what it means and wholesome causes bring wholesome effects and vice versa so when the mind has joy that when the mind is this um, and the Pali is tasa tathagata nganusarato so when one recollects the, the Tathagata, the Buddha, Chittang Pasidati. And Pasidati is that word, that, that, that triple meaning word, where it means like to calm down, to be uplifted, and to have confidence. <laughs> so it's a really interesting compound of, in one word that holds all these meanings together. Were you going to ask something, Paul? Okay. And, uh, and it's true, it's so true. The upliftment, confidence, and, or faith, and, and joy. Um, is that? And tranquility, calm, serenity. These three things, is, it is true, it comes together. When there's joy, there's confidence, there's, you know. Um, I was ta talking about the analogy of the plane coming out of the clouds last time. And at some point in the meditation, especially in retreat, you see people when they they kind of get the technique really like they start they start beaming, you know, they start beaming light, literally. <laughs> I was reading a, I was reading an article like, nah, I'm not lying. <laughs> There's this called biophotons. <laughs> if you want scientific proof, <laughs> there is something called yeah. There is actual like luminosity of like. Uh, matter like it exists <laughs> and um, there are suttas and even the Buddha says it but people are like yeah whatever but it's true uh, it says there's four kinds of light there's uh, monks there is the light of the moon the light of the sun the light of fire and the light of wisdom and it's true <laughs> um of course, the Buddha was said to have like this halo, but I'm not, or like his skin was very often defined as uh, radiant. Um, so, chittang pasidati, pamo jang upadati. So, yes. Sorry? Sorry, people that are listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> so, chitang pasidati. So that that is the. Um, this kind of soothing, uplifting effect, and then um, pamo jang upadjati. And we we've seen that sequence very often in other suttas where he's where he says. And see, this is kind of both ways. This is when we see it's both ways. Because in the Samanyapala Sutta, the, the book that you brought back, the, um, the sequence is one abandons the hindrances, the defilements is the same. Gladness arises, Pamojang uh, Jayati. Uh, and then uh, he says, Piti Jayati. Uh, then that joy. But here it's by recollecting this, the mind gets glad and then the defilements are abandoned. 
So, huh? How does it work? <laughs> Which way? <laughs> it's actually both ways. <laughs> so whenever there is... If we use a recollection to uplift the mind, to bring the joy, defilements fade away. That's the power of joy. And when we abandon the defilements, however that is, by letting go, usually, and joy, joy arise even more. So we have... See how the seven supports of awakening work. They don't just work in a linear way, they work in many ways. <laughs> and the joy is like this agent that is strengthening everything. It, because when there's there's joy, there's got to be letting go. You can't you can't practice the meditation on joy if you don't if you keep bringing into mind all these things thinking thinking you have to let go and then there's that bright clarity that arises and uh, this makes the defilements drop also so it's both ways just as the way to clean one's dirty head is through diligent effort, Visaka. How is the dirty head cleansed by diligent effort? And this is where it's different from what we do. <laughs> Just so you know, the next analogies, there will be differences <laughs> with the contemporary world. By applying powder, clay, water, and by applying one's own effort, this is how a dirty head is cleansed by diligent effort. So maybe we can send that to uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies or the <laughs> shampoo making clay. <laughs> and then again, he will emphasize the, his first uh, recollection that he said. In the same way, impurities in the mind are cleansed by diligent effort, Visaka. How? Here, one who follows the path of the Aryas repeatedly calls to mind the Buddha in this way. The awakened one is an Arahant. And he goes through that whole list again. I, I will not go through it, but I will go through the happy one. When one repeatedly calls to mind the Buddha, the mind becomes calm and bright then joy wells up from within and the mind sheds its defilements. Then one is called a wise follower who observes the divine observance. And this is divine, I've translated Brahma as divine. It could be translated as observance with God if you would like that, but it's also divine, I feel, is more accessible, probably. At that time, we have to understand that this was understood as being, you know, uh, it's, it was a very positive thing. It was a very, you know, uh, like in India, uh, uh, guests are God. <laughs> like, that's how you treat guests, as they were God, because that's just the way it works. That's just the way they see life that's just the way it, so we live a little bit in a different environment but a wise then one is called a wise follower who observes the divine observance who lives in union with the divine and by one's devotion to the divine one's mind becomes clear and bright and joy wells up from within, and the mind sheds its defilements. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I think it is. This is how the impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice, Visaka. Again, one who follows the path of the Aryas repeatedly calls to mind the teaching, the Dhamma, in this way. The teaching of the Awakened One is perfectly explained. Swakato. That's what it means. It's well, well explained. Uh, a lot of 
people, uh, even different uh, spiritual traditions, will say that even Buddhism is well known for how clear it is expounded, how clear and you know systematic it is, because this is not found in a lot of different uh, places. Um, directly visible, timeless, inviting, uplifting to be experienced by the sages within oneself. <clears throat> so this is one, one that is particularly good to keep in mind and this is really a, really a precious recollection to um, remember how well explained, how swakato it is, how sandittiko, how directly visible it is. We get angry. It feels bad. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. Anger never feels good. Like when we're angry, we're not happy. We let go of anger. We bring up joy or love. It's directly visible. <laughs> we're happy. It works. <laughs> that's this. That's just it. That's it. There's no. You know. There's no. There's no. Um, you don't need to believe blindly in this. You know. That's what the Buddha taught. Y you abandon these unskillful states like jealousy, anger, pride, all these things. You bring up loving kindness. You be benevolent. You practice generosity. Your your mind is your mind is happy. Life is good. <laughs> so it's directly visible. Um, here and now and it's timeless it was like that at the time of the Buddha it's not gonna change it was like that before he says it's not new what he discovered is not new it's always been there it's akaliko it's timeless it's he, he said it was like walking in the jungle and discovering this ancient city it was already there it's just forgotten that you know uh, the virtue how to practice meditation which is mental development letting go of unskillful states, cultivating skillful states, then they stick. They they, they, they stick to us. <laughs> the virtue they become it becomes integrated and our life becomes really good. It, it becomes mind doesn't have these weights, you know, it's not weighed down by worry or remorse of what I did. No, it's like the virtue makes it clear. It's like I didn't do that. So that's good. <laughs> like, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't lie to anybody. Like, do you, you remember like saying a lie to someone? How bad that feels? Like, you have to tell a thousand more lies about it to cover it up, and then, and then you're always thinking about it. You're never free. It's it's so so bad. <laughs> and then uh, all all the other ones too is the same. It's really just to uplift us us. And it's inviting. That's exactly for those reasons. Ehi pasiko. Ehi means come. Ehi pasiko. Come, come, in, come and see. Pasa and ko is like it's inviting. So it's, it's a kind of an adjective. It's a it's a come and see adjective. <laughs> inviting. So <laughs> ehi pasiko. Because when the Buddha uh, at the beginning, the monks would come to him. Well, somebody would want to ordain they would ask for ordination he would say ehi bhikkhu ehi means come come bhikkhu and that would be their ordination now it's a lot more complicated but when the buddha was there it's like ehi bhikkhu ehi so come <laughs> and so and it's inviting because it's a very happy practice you know there's no of course, there is a whole cosmology side to it and all these things, but you don't even have to believe in that. Like, if, you, if it's not in your experience, like, it doesn't matter. Like, just leave it. <laughs> and if you don't like it, it's fine. It doesn't, doesn't change the fact that um, this teaching is about mental development. It, it's just that you can develop the mind up to these states. But, you know... Um, you don't need to uh, practice uh, 24 hours a day you know to to experience the Dhamma it's it's here and now
Opanaiko, uplifting, leading upwards or onwards, but I prefer upwards, Opanaiko. It definitely is an uplifting uh, teaching. To be exper experienced by the wise or the sages within oneself. And so this is, although this is not a teaching that you can force people to listen to or to practice, it's, that would be pointless. People have to come and try, try it for themselves because um, uh, nobody can awaken another. Like, I mean, the Buddha helped <laughs> for sure. <laughs> like you can help people, of course, but you can't awaken somebody else. You have to they have and that's why they're called sages that's why they call the wise because they have to take it in hand you know <laughs> they have to you have to be interested you have to kind of uh, look for it you have to understand you know like oh it's true you know like if I do these things like I'm actually causing myself problems and then if I don't do them it's beneficial for me and then if I cultivate love well I'm winning a lot <laughs> and then um, so but these that reasoning only comes within oneself and you can only experience the dharma for you so and that's also a beauty of it when one repeatedly calls to mind the buddha the mind becomes clear and bright oh this is the dharma actually this is a mistake see then joy wells up from within and the mind sheds its defilements and so of course there's more to to these recollections and we can really you can develop your own you know the, these are universal like really uh, how do you say that but you can add anything to it you know like that is in your experience that is more of a personal kind of you know if you you have a you know I don't know you have a particular Buddha statue that you like and you can like bring that to mind and like it works for me anyways I, uh, or a particular aspect of the Dhamma that really brings joy to you and like Bhikkhu Bodhi says sometimes we, we, we will kind of bring up these ideas and they feel kind of dry they're not really inspiring at the very beginning but actually the doing it like he's saying like it comes with effort you know like you can't just like look at your clothes and your basin and just like <laughs> just be happy and think about it and just like try try to find the upliftment in the dharma that will bring that joy however that is for you and it's just like the loving kindness in the book and we have all these possibilities that you can find for yourself whichever one works like, uh, for my mom it was uh, to know that some people are practicing this unconditionally and to know that they're loved whatever whatever it is and for for her that was what resonated out of all of the you know troubleshooting the love <laughs> there's like so many of them and for her that was that but for other people actually it wasn't that at all it was another thing so so that's why I've tried to kind of put it all there so that you, you know you just pick what works for you that's fine <laughs> just as long as the joy arises it's great just as the way to clean one's dirty body is through diligent effort Visaka and how so? By using a scrub, chunang powder, water, and by applying one's own effort. This is how one cleans one's dirty clothes, one's dirty body through diligent effort, Visaka. In the same fashion, impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice. How? Here, one who follows the path of the Aryas repeatedly calls to mind the teaching in this way. The teaching of the Awakened One is perfectly explained, directly visible, timeless, inviting, uplifting, to be experienced by the sages within oneself. 
and I was I started talking about Bhikkhu Bodhi when he says it's a bit dry at the beginning but then we kind of feel it's like digging down this hole and at some point we see a little bit of water you know it's just like the bottom there and it's like at some point you just hit like the vein and you you have all this kind of you know you're close to the water so you just keep going and then at some point it's just this beautiful joy that arises and so you just keep doing it and it's the same thing these are actually really good loving kindness instructions too <laughs> to be honest mm -hmm. whatever works for you <laughs> mm. When one repeatedly calls to mind the teaching, the mind becomes clear and bright. Then joy wells up from within, and the mind sheds its defilements. Then one is called a wise follower who observes the observance of the law of goodness, who lives in union with the law of goodness, and by, one, and by one's devotion to the law of goodness, One's mind becomes clear and bright, and joy wells up from within, and the mind sheds its defilements. This is how the impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice. The impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice, Visaka, and how, how so? Here, one who follows the path of the Aryas repeatedly calls to mind the community in this way. The community of the Awakened One's practice is good. The community of the Awakened One's practice is straight. The community of the Awakened One's practice is logical or systematic. The community of the Awakened One's practice is meaningful. So. Um, That this is uh, Su Patipano Bhagavato Sawakasango. Uju Patipano. Su Su Patipano is good. Uju Patipano is straight. Uh, Nyaya Patipano is logical, systematic. And um, Samichi is, uh, is with meaning, it's, it's meaningful. These are the four pairs of people together making eight types of individuals. These are the stream enterer, non, uh, once returner, non returner, arahant, four levels of understanding of the path. And this is the real Sangha. Uh, of course, there's people who are wearing robes, but actually, the Buddha says that the real Sangha, this is these people, whoever that is. This is the community of the awakened one. Such people are truly worthy of support, of hospitality, of offerings, of homage. They are the unpre unprecedented field of good karma for this world. When one repeatedly calls to mind the community, the mind becomes clear and bright, then joy wells up from within, and the mind sheds its defilements. Just as the way to clean one's dirty clothes is through diligent effort, Visaka. And how is it so? By applying heat, by adding baking soda. That's, that's a modern adaptation. It's different a bit. Cow dung, water, and by applying one's own effort. See, it's a little bit, a little bit different. We do things a little bit different nowadays. But uh, this is... Uh, Gomaya. This is how one <laughs> cleans one's dirty clothes through diligent effort. <clears throat> I wonder how they had such nice whites. <laughs> Maybe that's just the answer to all of our our problems. <laughs> So he goes through that whole sequence again and then he says, Then one is called a wise follower who observes the observance of the community, who lives in communion with the community, and by one's devotion to the community, 
one's mind becomes clear and bright and joy wells up from within and the mind sheds its defilements it's a little bit different than looking at your nostril tips isn't it <laughs> I don't know but I haven't seen these instructions in here anyways <laughs> so I see just joy and uh, the impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice visaka how here one who follows the path of the aryas repeatedly calls to mind their own blameless behavior in this way and this is the purpose the real purpose of virtue this virtue which is unbroken unbreached constant flawless liberating recommended by the wise unspoiled and leading directly to samadhi see and that's another place where and that's a very stuck sequence here that he uses quite a bit um, that in fact virtue leads to samadhi like it and it's not like maybe it is like yes like really <laughs> it, it, these are actually the the instructions that he gives that are the closest to how to enter samadhi so making sure the virtue is really good because then mind doesn't you know every time we have uh, we break virtues or we we don't behave in the virtuous way it will just come back in the mind it's just the way it is it's the dharma we'll just feel bad and if we don't feel guilty that means that it's really bad actually <laughs> that you, you, <laughs> you even like learn to shut it out and that's so you have another more layer of stuff to go through you know sometimes some people have to go through all of that in retreat they have to go through you know they don't even see that so we have to go even through that first layer of not even seeing that and then and then <laughs> it comes out but <laughs> um, although this is not everybody don't worry and that's why <laughs> that's why we uh, and that's why we practice the virtue and because it's because it is uplifting and it uplifts the mind and peace when one repeatedly calls to mind one's own blameless behavior the mind becomes clear and bright and joy wells up from within and the mind sheds its defilements and this is not selfish this is just realistic this is just and the buddha actually teaches us to do that to to consider because there are so many things you can spend your life thinking about <laughs> but you can't think about what you didn't do also <laughs> like the things that the good things that you did or the, the the good things that it's good that you didn't do or the this this talk i was listening uh, from um ajan covilo and he says that ajan pasano uh they were asking him because he's a very senior monk uh what and he started like monasteries and helped build a lot of communities especially in the west and he's the abbot of Abayagiri which is like the biggest monastery in um, northern America in the states California and they asked him the monks asked him like what he was the most uh, happy about in his life you know the, his accomplishments and he said that I didn't hurt anybody <laughs> And so I think that's so beautiful and so profound. And we often really overlook that. Like uh, this, this truly, like he, he's done so many things. And the first thing that comes to his mind is that he's so happy he didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> because, yeah, these things, they, they actually hurt us in the first place so much that it's... Uh, it's not good to have that it's good to just be rid of that just as the way to clean the dirty mirror is through diligent effort visaka and how is it so 
by using sesame oil, ashes, and a brush, and by applying one's own effort. This is how one cleans a dirty mirror by diligent effort. In the same way, the impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice, Visaka. And he goes back saying, all of this recollecting one's own virtue. Then one is called a wise follower who observes the observance of blameless behavior, who lives in union with blameless behavior. And by one's devotion to blameless behavior, one's mind becomes clear and bright, and joy wells up from within and the mind shed its defilements. This is how the impurities are cleansed, Visaka. Here, one who follows the path of the Aryas repeatedly calls to mind the Devas. And this is uh, um, something that is like uh, an aspect of the path maybe that is less popular here but I'll just run through it anyways and it's quite interesting um, that recollecting the devas is actually really uplifting also there are the devas of the four great directions the four great kings there are the th there are the devas of the 33 there are the devas of Yama there are the serene devas and this is each is the levels beyond this there are the creation loving devas there are the devas beyond the power of creation there are devas of radiant bodies there are devas even beyond this it is because of their faith that those devas transmigrated and took birth here such faith is also found in me this is the recollection it is because of their virtue, it is because of their learning, it is because of their generosity and their discernment, their wisdom, that those, tra that those devas transmigrated and took birth here. Such, such, such qualities are also found in me. I'm, I'm kind of making it a little bit shorter. Um, so to recollect that these, these beautiful qualities of the devas are also uh, found uh, within oneself that can be a very uplifting um, recollection just that hmm, when one repeatedly calls to mind that qual the qualities of faith virtue learning generosity and discernment found in the devas are also found within them the mind becomes clear and bright then joy wells up from within and the mind shed its, sheds its defilements just as the way to clean, to clean tarnished gold is through diligent effort Visaka and how is it so? by using a furnace, salt, red chalk, a blowpipe and tongs and by applying one's own effort, Visaka, this is how one cleans tarnished gold through diligent effort. In the same way, the impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice, Visaka. Now it goes through the whole recollection. And these five points here are another list. <laughs> another, this, this is a faith. Uh, it's usually faith, learning, generosity, discernment, and virtue. Th these are five, usually also the qualities of a trainee or a learner on the path. So this is another. If you really like lists and you want to remember all of the things, <laughs> these are also found in the suttas as uh, qualities of, of a learner, of someone who's the, the qualities that we should develop as and that's it's really interesting to see learning here right that is like sutta but it's not su sutta it's sutta it's s u t a one t and so this is uh this is the learning aspect of and sometimes you know here we have a big emphasis on meditation especially in the west but um uh the Buddha says, you know, you have to learn this. You have to, there's no other way. You have to learn how it works because 
otherwise yeah, it, it doesn't work <laughs> the mind becomes clear and bright then joy wells up from within the mind shed its defilements then one is called a wise follower who observes the observance of the devas who lives in union with the devas and by one's devotion to the devas one's mind becomes clear and bright joy wells up from within and the mind sheds its defilements this is how the impurities of the mind are cleansed by diligent practice visaka now we step to phase two of the observance of the aryas and this is mainly talking about virtue um, but it, it's in a special way we we want to understand it as and it's really interesting also to to see the virtues as connected to the behavior of a fully awakened person this is also one of the reasons why we follow these virtues then Visaka a wise practitioner considers for as long as they live arahants discard the harming of living beings and refrain from it with neither stick nor sword conscientious and benevolent they live empathetic to the welfare for the welfare of other beings let me also for this day and night discard the harming of living beings and refrain from it for this observance day I will emulate this quality of the awakened ones this will constitute part of my observance see this is really why also we practice these virtues virtues is not um, it's uh, full awakening is actually these virtues become locked in like we, we just couldn't harm you know consciously it's not that you can't step on something and you don't know but consciously like wanting to hurt something would not it, it cannot be it simply cannot be for as long as they live arahants discard the taking of things which are not given and refrain from it taken only what is given expecting only what is given they live without stealing with inner purity let me also for this day and night discard the taking of things which are not given and refrain from them for this observance day I will emulate this quality of the awakened ones this will constitute part of my observance for as long as they live arahants discard sexuality and refrain from it living with the divine without another partner staying away from sexual intercourse the way of common folk well this is more of a my uh, monk practice uh, but uposatha is that would be um, this is where it diverges 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 yes diverge diverges <laughs> is um kame sumi chachara is the misconduct in sexual behavior is that means that doesn't mean abstinence that means or like celibacy it just means you just you know no hurt or wrong coming to anybody uh, whereas this would be more like a um, taking the eight virtues kind of thing on retreat for example when we kind of go beyond that and this is uh, for this observance day I will emulate this quality of the awakened ones this will constitute part of my observance for as long as they live arahants discard the speaking of lies and refrain from it they turn away from speaking lies known to speak the truth filled with the truth firm and trustworthy not deceivers of the world let me also for this day and night discard the speaking of lies and refrain from it I recommend more than just this day and night but <laughs> <coughs> for this observance day I will emulate this quality of the awakened ones for as long as they live, arahants discard the consumption of mind-altering substances and refrain from it. 
Let me also, for this day and night, discard the consumption of mind-altering substances. For this observance day, I will emulate this quality of the awakened ones. For as long as they live, Arahants eat one meal a day, not eating in the evening. They refrain from eating at unsuitable times. Let me also, for this day and night, eat one meal a day. For as long as they live, Arahants refrain from dancing, singing, listening to music, seeing entertainment shows, wearing necklaces, perfumes, and beautifying the body with cosmetics. Let me also refrain from it. For as long as they live, Arahants discard the use of elevated and luxurious beds and seats and refrain from them. They sleep on small, low beds, close to the ground, made of straw or natural stuffing. Let me also use these. Uh, well, refrain from high and luxurious beds. <laughs> Sorry. Got... Uh, Now this is, a, of course, this is a breakdown of the eight virtues, not just the five, if you want to take the five. It's like, if you want to sleep in your bed. I mean, this is India a long time ago, so <laughs> now it's actually hard to find a place there's not a bed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it's a lot more complicated, actually. Um, so, yes, so this is the observance of the Aryas, Visaka. The supposata observance of the Aryas yields abundant fruits. It is highly beneficial, of refulgent brightness, vast and pervasive. And just how meritorious is this? And now this is the section where, this is the last section, I swear. <laughs> and this is where um, we get to learn a little bit about the the merits of practicing this just one one time this uposata um, and that's where the buddha talks a little bit about the devas and their cosmology and how does it bear such great fruits how is it so highly beneficial just how is it of such refulgent brightness how is it so vast and pervasive even if visaka a person were to become the sole ruler and king over these 16 great nations overflowing with riches and these were known as the 16 Mahajanapadas the 16 nations of northern India at that time which coalesced together under the rule of King Ajatasattu and the Mauryan Empire, King Ashoka very soon after, there is no more 16 but the kingdoms of Anga, Magadha Kasi, Kosala, Vaji, Mala, Cheti, Wanga, Kuru, Panchala, Macha, Surasana, Asaka, Awanti, Gandhara, Kamboja. Compared to this Uposata observance complete in these eight components, this is not even worth the least part of a sixteenth than to rule over all these things and that's, that's just the beginning <laughs> why human kingship is pitiful visaka compared to divine bliss 50 human years equal but a single day and night for the devas of the four great kings and now you're going to get an idea of how long it is that the, these devas live and how do they live there are 30 of such days in their month, twelve of such months in their year. The devas of the four great kings have a lifespan of five hundred such celestial years. So fifty human years is a, is a day. It is possible, Visaka, that a man or woman here who has performed the Suposata observance complete in these eight components will, when their body gives out after death, be reborn instantly in the entourage of the devas of the four great kings. 
It was in reference to this that I said, human kingship is pitiful, Visaka, compared to divine bliss. A hundred human years, Visaka, equates but a single day and night for the devas of the 33. This is a Tavatimsa. That's where Saka lives. The Some people have heard the stories about this. There are 30 of such days in their month and 12 of such months in their year. The devas of the 33, the 33's lifespan is a thousand of such celestial year. It is possible that a man or woman here who has performed this upilsata observance, complete with these eight components, will, when their body gives out after death, be reborn instantly in the entourage of the devas of the 33. It was in reference to this that I said, human kingship is pitiful compared to divine bliss. 200 human years, Visaka, equates but a single day and night for the devas of Yama. Their lifespan is 2,000 two such celestial year. 400 human years, Visaka, equate but a single night, day and night, for the serene devas. And this is the Tusita heaven. Tusita is the place where the Buddhas are set to all come from right before they take their last birth as a bodhisattva, as an awakened being. This is where his mother also went. Eight hundred human years, Visaka, equate but a single day and night for the creation loving devas. And their lifespan is 8,000 such celestial years. 1,600 human years, Visaka, equate but a single day and night for the devas who wield power over creation. Those devas' lifespan is 16,000 such celestial year. It was in reference to this that I said human kingship is pitiful, Visaka, compared to divine bliss. One should, and these are the end verses, one should neither hurt the living nor take what is offered not, neither speak falsehood nor take intoxicants, mastering one's sexual impulses, not trespassing on one's union with the divine, without eating at night, beyond the proper time frame being without jewelry cosmetics and perfumes making this earth your bed sleeping on a sim on a simple mat this suposata observance complete in these eight components bring one closer to the end of trouble as the buddha explained both the moon and sun so beautiful to look at their pervasive radiance all around banishing darkness while they traverse the skies, shining through space, illuminating the directions. Whatever wealth is possible to acquire for oneself, pearls of jewels, pearls and jewels, lapis lazuli, lazuli, and lucky charms, horn, horn gold or mountain gold, even the best of hataka gold, the suposata observance complete in these components. These are not worth, compared to this observance, these are not worth one sixteenth, just as the moon's radiance is compared to the stars. Similarly, that virtuous woman or man who observes the suposata observance complete in these eight components, filled with the bliss of such bright actions, blameless are bound for the happiest states sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. very patient audience <laughs> so that was my week <laughs> um, um, 
I saw a lot of mistakes in there. Where yes. Oh yes. I'm afraid I've dropped the lesson time. Yes, that's that's okay. <laughs> I think I got the gist though. Very very good. Very good. <laughs> so don't forget the joy <laughs> because I think that's really what it all comes down to. Eh? Whether it comes before abandoning defilements or after or whatever, where you want to put it, but don't forget the joy. And uh, I hope you have a beautiful, joyful week. Well, it's a joy being with you. <laughs> well, it's a joy that to have all of you here. And we can listen to the Dharma, talk about the Dharma. Have a good time. <laughs> okay, maybe do you have a question? Oh, yes, yes. Here, I just have to go like this. <laughs>